Ingve Malmstein joins me live right now on Trunk Nation. Good to see you, Ingve. How are you? Hey, good. Good to see you. Last time we spoke, you were getting ready for your live stream in Vegas, which was I had the honor of hosting, and I had a chance to watch. I got to tell you, man, I saw a lot of live streams during the lockdown. I loved what you did in that. I thought it looked great. Thought it sounded great. I I recently met the guy who did the lighting. I went to uh, with my family to see Mystere in Vegas, and he told me he did your lighting for that. I thought it was fantastic. What did you make of doing that stream? I mean, it was it was interesting for sure. I mean, obviously, I prefer to have the audience there, you know. But it, it was I certainly enjoyed doing that better than not doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, Strange in a way, you know, but but it was cool. Yeah, well, you had some audience there, not a lot, but there were a few people in the room, right? Just to give it some feel. There was a couple. <laughs> yeah, but it was definitely cool. Now you've done live shows just before we came on the air. You were telling me that you you have done a few live shows. How has that gone? And how has it felt to be back on stage with a full audience? Amazing. I mean, amazing. I mean, we would play, did uh, for Lauderdale and Tampa. And then we did Dallas, Houston, and San Antonio. And it was better than ever. I mean, maybe I forgot how cool it was. <laughs> no, it was fantastic. I mean, really, really full house. Beautiful. It was amazing. Yeah, I saw some photos on your social media, and it looked amazing. The, the rooms were full. I know some of the show. I, I guess most of the shows were sold out. You had the big wall of marshals behind you. It looked like really nice rooms and venues. I, yeah. I know that you were you were itching to, you know, I know you spent a lot of time in your studio making this record, which we'll talk about, but I, I imagine for the fans and for you to be reconnected like that had to feel incredible. It was so weird because, you know, where I live, that during this period, you know, the pandemic thing, we, if we were never really on the lockdown. It was never really a lockdown. So everyday life was the same, but it wasn't until then I realized how much I actually go out and play, how much I tour normally, you know, because it was like, what, what's going on, you know? I'm so, I'm so used to going that I didn't feel like, it felt weird, you know? It's really strange. But it was cool. Yeah, well, you we spent the whole time in the studio, uh, and it made a little difference, I think, you yeah. Yeah, for those that don't know, you live in Florida, and you're right. You know, I've been out traveling in the last six months quite a bit, and depending upon what state you go to, in some places, you know, I've gone on stage to introduce bands. I'm like, isn't it great to have shows back? And if I'm in Florida or Texas or places like that, they'll look at me like, we, we were always still having shows. So it depends where you are, depending upon how much people have been missing music, I guess. No, no sh sh that, I mean... The shows were not allowed, but regular life, you know, like there wasn't like we were had to be stay inside and stuff like some, some other places, you know. But uh, yeah, no, I mean, I mean, it's it's it's, it's I know we have this thing in November, December. I'm trying to get as much as possible in, in the interim period. I'm going to book stuff <laughs> so as soon as possible. I can find out. I will let you know. So you well, you and you also, Ingve, have a huge global following. You play all over the world. And that, I imagine, is going to be a challenge for a while to be able to, to travel internationally. Have you or your team looked into that? Do you have shows outside of the US? I just did a, a heavy metal, <clears throat> I just did a headline, a Serbian festival. You did? Yes, it was called Arsenal Festival in Serbia, in uh, Belgrade. And that was, man, that was like a couple of months ago. It was amazing, 40,000 people. Did you have any issues getting in and out of the country? Were there any issues there with COVID? No, I mean, you know, you know, they what they make a test, you know, take a test, but I'm vaccinated, so I'm not worried about it. You know, right. I think I think this is a bad thing, but I, I think you know, you gotta live a life too. You can't stop living, you know. No, I agree with you completely, and that's my attitude about it too. I'm vaccinated, and I'm going to go out and do what I've got to do, and hope for the best, and be as smart as you can be. But that's awesome that you were able to go out and play internationally. Do you have more stuff lined up outside of the country? Well, I mean, we're working on everything right now. The whole world. We we're working on South America, working on Europe, working on Japan. Um, you know, it's just they're very hesitant. You know. You know, so it's not me working on it anyway, but I mean, it's, it's the agents, but um, it's it's uh, as much as possible, as soon as possible, hopefully. Well, one of the things we we touched on this a little bit and you you shared the news about making this record when you were on with me last a few months ago to promote the stream. And that is uh, this new record that you made, Parabellum. And I remember when you 
broke the news about this record on this show, you had said, you'd made a comment to me where you said, I actually even pushed myself beyond where I thought I could go in making this record. Now the record's out, everybody has had a chance to hear it. What exactly did you mean by that? Just in terms of the time you had to work on it, your approach to playing, what, what were you trying to set out to do with all this time you had during the pandemic to make a new record? One thing I learned a long time ago is that too much time is also not good because you overthink things. And also I don't do takes over and over like in here for a solo, one take, that's it. And they improvise, you know, they improvise the solos. Uh, you know, for other parts, you know, the written parts, you know, I gotta make sure the tight and all that stuff and vocals and this and that. But uh, I think what happened was I wrote probably 80 or 90 things almost a hundred, hundred pieces. It's on the computer now. So out of them, I, I picked 10, yeah? So that was one thing. You could just pick whatever I felt was like the best, the best, the best, the best. Also, after you, you know, you put it down, you live with it and you change things. And, you know, because often I, I, I noticed that in the past, I go, maybe a year later, I go, oh, I should have done that. I should have done this. On this one, all of that happened, you know? It was all, it were all little tweaks and changes that I'd like, you know, chorus here and 16 bars more here and solo in C sharp instead of whatever. You know, all that stuff happened because it was all the time. It was so much time, you know? <laughs> it's kind of cool in a way, but it was not the right circumstance, I guess. Well, it, it could make you go crazy though, too, because when you, you have your own studio, you're producing the record yourself outside of drums, you're doing everything, writing the material, playing everything on the record yourself. So I imagine it could make you go crazy after a while too, because you, you don't have anybody there telling you, no, leave it. It's done. You just keep obsessing over it. At least I would, if I was a musician, I would think that would make me crazy after a while. But that's exactly what I've, the lesson I learned is to not do that in the studio. You, you cut it, and you leave. Or you go to do another thing, you know, another part, you know. But you don't stay on one thing for too long because it never gets better. And then when you hear it afterwards in a car or whatever, you hear it differently. And you may go, oh, wow, this is good. Or you go, ah, it could be different, you know. Then, then a couple of days, a week later, you do another one. And then you live with that for a bit. And then, then you, you let that kind of like... Uh, you know, ripe to make it ripen, so to speak, you know, because, you know, I learned that less than many years ago that if you're in the studio and you write and you record and stuff, you go over and over, try this, try that, try that. It never gets better. It never gets better. You just got no one to say, okay, that's good. And then you listen English. to it later and you can really say, no, it's not good or it's good because you hear it a little different. Yeah. Yeah. Ingvi, are you one of those guys that goes back and ever listens to your old records or do you make a record and then you just always are thinking forward? Do you ever go back and like put on Marching Out or, or the first record or anything like that? Or, or you only just are always thinking about the next thing? Always forward. I never listen to the old stuff. Um, I appreciate what it is for what it is. And I appreciate that that was a period in time when I, what I did then, it was definitely the best I could do but to me to do that it's like it's not the, the you know it's going backwards like you said you know and I don't like that you know and same thing when I play the songs live I play them differently you know I, you know I, I always tweak it a little bit you know not the, the structure but the solos and everything and uh otherwise it, it feels it feels you know doing the same thing again it doesn't feel good to me you know it needs to, I, I kind of like sitting here or I sit in front of TV or whatever. I kind of wait for things to happen. I don't say, okay, I'm going to do this now, which I could do. If you ask me to do a, write a content western song, I could do that. For 10 minutes later, I will have the song for you. But that's not what I want to do. What I want to do is to let things come to me. And I don't know really where it came from. It just happened. I go, wow, that's cool. So that's, that's the luxury of having the time and your own place because I remember back in the day when the clock was running and you had to record and you had to do this and it was terrible. I didn't like it. I always liked this place better. Yeah, I mean, you you, uh, you obviously, when you play live, you have a big catalog of music now. So you've got the new album, Parabellum, and then you've got your whole catalog. Even watching that live stream, I mean, having been a fan of yours since the beginning, 
you want to hear Black Star, you want to hear some of the old stuff. And then, of course, you want to hear the new things as well. So do you enjoy playing the older material and, and maybe putting a slightly different spin on it by doing that? Does that help keep it fresh for you to still keep in the set? That's yeah, that's exactly right. You know, uh, I did a couple of years ago, just to kind of illustrate the point. I made a live video and a live album and the two, two live shows are recorded one night apart. And you can hear, if you listen to Far Beyond the Sun from one night and the second night, they're not the same. I did it on purpose, live in Tampa, live in Orlando, because that's how I do it. I don't never play it the same way. If I, if I did, I would, I don't know, I don't, I, I wouldn't have enjoyed it. You know, I don't like that. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Parabellum, the new record that's out now, what does Parabellum mean, Ingve? Parabellum is Latin, and it means prepare for war. But the whole phrase is civis possum parabellum. It means if you want peace, prepare for war. It's, it's sort of like peace through strength kind of thing. It's like some old Roman centurion said like 3,000 years. It's cool. And the album cover is very cool. It's a, it's a painting, it looks like. What's the story on the cover? It's a, it's a painting. And it's uh, going to be donated to charity. Oh, so this painting is going to be or was donated to charity, the original? Going to be, yeah. Yes. Okay, so that's so that's the cover, and then uh, that's also if you have the CD, which I have, you get you get that on the actual disc itself. It's yeah, it's very cool. I was just wondering if it was somebody that you knew that did it, or what the story of the backstory was. No, no, I, I didn't know. The band, as I mentioned, there really is no band now. You do everything on this record. You you're now singing, and I think your voice gets better with each record i mean i know you did the blues cover record not too long ago where you sang everything on that you seem to get much more comfortable as a singer talk a little bit about your evolution as a as a singer everybody knows your ability as a guitar player but do you feel more comfortable taking the lead vocal job now yeah i mean you know it's 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 kind of like something that i kind of before i came to america I was doing now i had a power trio when i was all singing you know but it was more like i sang like a little bit and then solos all the time you know um, since 1984, it, it was my solo career since 1984. So it was never really a band ever since 1984. It was like, you know, you, 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 here's your paycheck, do this, you know, type of thing. Um, so it, it, it was maybe that it, some people don't understand that, but that's okay. Um, I, I, I feel very comfortable with it. It's a natural thing. It's kind of like, almost like a full circle. You know, when I was like 17 years old, I would not worry about what the radio was. I wouldn't worry about nothing. I'd just play and record and sing whatever I felt like, you know. And but so, I have a funny story for you. If um, So I started in bands and stuff when I was like nine or 10 years old. And bands were, they, they, the other guys were 20 years, 25, whatever. So I kept on going, kept on doing things. And I, I formed all little things, Powerhouse and Rice Force and everything. Um, and before I went to America. And I tried everything, nothing worked, you know, in Sweden, they, they wouldn't want to know because my music was very unusual. And also it, it was not, not like a couple of years later when Sweden was really full of bands, you know, it was different. Um, so I, I read a guitar player magazine to send a cassette tape, you know, so I did. I sent a cassette tape, tape in. guess who played on that one? I played the drums, I played the bass, I played the keyboards, I sang. I played the guitar, obviously. So that was 1982. So this is not new. This right. is not all. It's, it's, I, it's just that I have everything here and I feel really like uh, inspired. I just play it and I record it and I put this down and I sing this and do that. It's like, just push a button. I'm, I have an engineer, but still, you know, it's not new really. It's just kind of like a full circle. So, so when you sent that tape, and that's a well-documented story, and of course, here in America, we first discovered you, you played on the Steeler record, then you did Alcatraz, and then the solo career started from there. But, but early on, you had, uh, whether it was Mark Bowles or Jeff Scott Soto or people like that singing on those records. So if you were singing in Sweden much younger on your material, 
what what facilitated the decision early on to have lead singers in your band and you not do it? Was it outside pressure from the record company or did you feel that was just the best way to introduce yourself as a solo artist? No, it, it was not. I never took pressure from anybody. I always did what I wanted to do. You know, that's why I'm so, that's what my song Eternal Bliss is about. It's like how thankful and grateful I am to, to God or whoever makes the decisions that I'm so, I'm very, very grateful for everything that, you know, that's come to me, you know. Um, no, there was, I guess it was a sign of the times, you know, like the 80s. You know what I mean? It was, it was a thing where, it, it, you know, it just felt natural to do it that way then. But I was still writing everything, you know. It wasn't any different. I was still writing all the melodies. I, even in Alcatraz, I wrote the vocal melodies. I didn't write the words, but I wrote, I wrote the, the melodies he sings. I wrote that. Is Ingve? is there any side of you that would ever like to be in a band again? I mean, I know for a brief time, I know you jammed once with Deep Purple. I know you, you know, there's been some little things here and there, but I imagine a guitar player like you, you're on a lot of people's list to try to get into a band, a super group, something like that. I know you love doing all this stuff yourself and, and clearly you're accomplished enough to do it, but is there any side of you that would ever again, like to work with other musicians and maybe join an, either an established band or put something together where you're a part of it instead of just the, the whole focus? Well, I, I like to say, never say never. I always say that, but uh, at this point in time, I have no leaning towards that. Uh, I often try to explain my way of work my way of artistry, so to speak. Because this is this is art, believe it or not. Music is art, just like painting and everything like this. And uh, so speaking of painting, like a painter, okay, he starts painting his painting and he's maybe in a studio or he's in the forest and painting something. But no matter where he is, the painter, he doesn't paint half the painting and then he calls his buddy up, hey, can you come over and paint the other side of the painting? You know, I need to, I need to help with that, this other side here. Uh, and that's basically how I work. I hear the whole thing in my head. I, I have it ready already. And, I, you know, a lot of people seem, the greatest bands in the world that I, lo I love them, Stones and Purple and Van Halen, and you name it, ACDC, all the great bands. They have a function, they, they work really well together where, the guitar player usually comes up with a riff or so, and then the drummer just beats, puts a beat down and it becomes like a song. And then the singer comes in and does his thing. And it works beautifully for them. It's a beautiful thing. You know, I, I love them. Now. All those bands, Queen, you name it. It's just, for some reason, I've always kind of like, I don't know, it's because you know, because when I grew up, it was, I was kind of like, uh, I don't know, I was very decisive, you know, and in, in, I, I knew exactly what I wanted. I, I was never really, I, would, I was never searching for anything. I, I knew, except that's that's it right there. <laughs> so it's, it, it, that's a lot of times, it, it, like say working together could be almost more difficult, you know, than actually co accomplishing I mean, it's, it's, it be, could be almost like a diluted version of what it is. You know, it's hard to just ex explain it. Like I said, though, I never say never. I mean, I'm always, you know, who knows? But not right now, I don't think. Is there any side of you that would ever like to work with any of the people you revisit working with, people you worked with in the past, whether it's JoLynn Turner, Graham Bonnet, any of these guys, would you... Do you feel like there's unfinished business there? Do you, if you did work with someone again, would you like it to be something brand new, or would you like to maybe go and revive something from your past that you'd love to revisit? If if I would do something with somebody, it would definitely be someone someone different. You know, not old. Different. Right. I I I definitely don't like that that going back thing. I, I never never understood that concept. <laughs> You, you know, you just mentioned a track on Parabellum called Eternal Bliss, which is my favorite track on the record. And one of the reasons why is I think your vocal's great on it. It's maybe the best vocal I've, I've heard you do yet lead singing. But the other thing about it is I love when you, I mean, I love all the fireworks as much as the next guy and all the shred stuff. But I love when you slow it down a little bit, like when I think of like the, what the record you did with Joe, a, a song called Hold On, which is one of my favorites you ever did. So I love when you go like bluesy and a little slower like that. 
And on Eternal Bliss, you've got, it's a great song, and then you've got a, a slightly different tempo and guitar playing approach to that. Talk about, you already talked about the inspiration for the song itself, but talk about how that one came together musically. Yeah, that one went through a few changes because that, that was the one thing about all the time that I had. For instance, I, the song would start, you know, originally with just that, that, that the verse chords, you know, and then the vocals come in. And then after I put down the vocals, I soloed out the, the chorus. You know, I saw the mixer, you solo it out. And I heard, oh, wow, that sounds cool. Let's put that in the beginning. And I would just put that in the beginning. And the solo started in A minor. And then I added, no, I should have one in D minor change. So I did a little change. The, 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 the song kind of really kind of like went through a few things. But most of the songs on the album did that too. It kind of started with one thing and then, it got a little added and a little bit more of this and a little different order, you know. So that was the beauty of having all the time, you know. Not so much the actual recording of it, but as to detailing and arranging and putting it together as far as, you know, the, the arrangements and stuff. But all of them were like that too. But uh, especially that one, I think. That one may be a good fight. And there was another kind of a groovy song called Relentless Fury. That one had different tempo in the beginning and i said now nah, nah, i'm gonna make it like a slow tempo in the beginning it was a fast same riff and melody and everything but just not yeah. change so you know things like that happen you know and the the last track on the record and and again uh Yngwie's album parabellum is out now sea of tranquility that's that's an epic tell me a little bit about that one it has a lot of it's it's very neo but they call it neoclassical now but to me it's classical it started you know kind of like a like a structure just in front of tv like like the d minor d minor a minor so um then i you know start that started playing on electric but i said i'm gonna start opening with the acoustic but it's much harder to play on acoustic so the, the fact that it kind of builds like this um i think that one has a gunshot in it too i'm not sure a gunshot. I didn't hear that, but um, it might be in there somewhere. I have to listen again because I just listened to it once real quickly before we talk. <laughs> there was there was an original idea I had back in 1986, actually, when I was recording Trilogy. And uh, there was something called sampling triggering te uh, technology. It was brand new. It's called emulator thing, which means that you could record something and trigger it with a key or, or a snare drum or something. I got whoa! So I I, I want I have a Smith and Wesson three fifty seven Magnum. I want that on the snare drum. Like the bah, every time it hits the snare drum, it's gonna sound like a gun, you know. So I I, I said, tell him to put a big tree stump in the studio and mic it up, and I bring the, the three fifty seven Magnum Smith and Wesson in the room <laughs> in the studio. They were crazy. And I started firing, you know, but it, we we couldn't record it. So it just kind of like failed the recording. Just sounded beep instead of Bruh. so this time. I actually had a Beretta 92 and I, I recorded it and it sounds really cool. I have it at the beginning of Relentless Fury. I have it in the, the, the key change on Wolf's door and there's two more. You've got Magic Bullet and then put one more. And I just kind of like add it to the snare drum and it sounds really cool, you know. It's crazy so, stuff. Cool. So you, so you, for this record, you actually went, shot a gun, mic'd it, and then used it as basically a drum sound. Yes. I don't know if anybody's ever done that before. <laughs> well, it's really that cool. That is awesome. Yeah, that is cool. Instead of trying to find a sample or something in a computer somewhere, you just went out and shot the gun. Yes. Uh, tell me about the tour you have coming up with my good buddy, John Five. That should be a lot of fun. Are you looking forward to that? Uh, it's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I don't I don't have it in my head right now the routing. But it's it's kind of like um there, it's it covers a lot, but it's there's a few places that we've missed in that route, so I'm gonna add that either before or after as well, you know. Uh, but it's gonna be how, great. I really love it. I, I I love it. It's really awesome. Ingve, how familiar are familiar are you with John as a player? Have you watched or seen him play very much? Do you know what he brings? I I, I have a good idea because I did some stuff to get me and him. We did some clinics together. And, you know, I've known him as a, as a friend long time, long time. You know, he's going to be, he's great. Go ahead. What, what's that? On your show, the Mel show. 
Oh yeah. He used to play all the time in the stands. You know, he was one of uh, the guys that did it the most playing up in the stands. I've told people this all the time. You were the guy that gave us that idea to have a, have a guitar player playing in the audience that came from you because for people that don't know the very first season ever of that metal show, Ingve was one of our guests and you flew from Miami to New York. You, you brought a guitar. And I remember saying to you, Ingve, we we're not set up for guitar. And you're like, well, just put a mic next to the chair and I'll play in and out of the commercials. That's what gave us the idea. So you started all of that. And uh, I thank you for it because it became a big bit that so many guitar players did. I know it was awesome. It was awesome. It was. It was I, I used to love that all the time. All, all, all that, that that show was great. I should be back, man. What's going on with that? Well, Bring thanks, it. man. I, <laughs> if you can find the network, we'll do it, Ingve. We'd love to do it again. We miss doing it. We hear that all the time. Who knows? We'll see what happens. But we'd love to. We just haven't been able to find a home for it. Hey, one other thing I wanted to ask you about before I let you go. Uh, before you came on the air, my producer Joel played a little bit which I completely forgot about of you doing Aerosmith dream on with Ronnie, the late, great Ronnie James Dio. What do you remember about that recording? Did you guys actually go in the studio together or were you in separate places when you recorded that? We were in separate places, but I played so many times with Ronnie. I was on tour with him. I met him the second day I came to America. I've been in America for one day. And then the, the guys in Steel, go, let's go to rainbows. I went, I met him and we hear off right away. And uh, I did so many tours with him and I, we would jam and do Man Seal Mountain and stuff like this on stage. And I did that one thing, uh, was it Stars? Yeah, yeah. Hearing Aid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, that one was, they just sent me the tape, you know, but it, it's really good. Ronnie was the greatest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a great, great version. You know, you mentioned knowing Dio so early on and, and being close with him. Did he ever talk to you about joining Dio? Did I imagine he would have been interested in you coming into the band? Did you ever have that conversation? We did. You know, that was back in the day. We snuck back a few and stuff. Um, but we had huge respect for each other. And we kind of both are like the, the undisputed leader's personality, you know? So it's, it, it could have been maybe not working, but it probably would have been great. It just, it just never happened. But I mean, we did tour a lot. We did tour a lot together. Oh, my God. We played in Hawaii, played all over the place. Yeah, yeah. Well, that would have been wild if that would have ever come through. But I understand what you're saying. Ronnie was very set in the ways he liked to do things. You're set in the way you like to do things. So if you did come together, the band may have lasted three days. <laughs> That's, you know, we were very, very friendly. We were like this. So you didn't want to destroy that, you know what I mean? Right, right. No, I totally understand that completely. Well, listen, man, the album sounds great. It's out now. Parabellum is the name of it. The new album from Ingve Malmsteen. If you love Ingve, there's nothing you're not going to love on this record. It's, it's a very cool record. Go online, uh, see where a date is coming near you. It's going to be a phenomenal tour. Ingve Malmsteen with John Five supporting and uh, that that will be a lot of notes. You're going to get a lot of guitar notes that night between those two bands. So get ready for that. And I hope to catch some of those shows uh, myself. It's great to see you, man. Congrats on the record. Thank you, Eddie.
Yeah.